Good evening. It's Wednesday, May 18th. My name is Douglas Griffin. This is my Wednesday night Bible study. We are in the book of John. We're in the sixth chapter starting that today. And we've been going through this for a couple months, started at chapter one, going verse by verse through the Bible. Uh, just easier to understand and get the correct context if you just go verse by verse through. Uh, so here's what, well, I just, I'm going to dive right in and then backtrack. Uh, in John chapter 6, verse 1, it says, After these things, and, and I'm stopping there because scholars go, which things? What things was he talking about? Okay, so after these things. Um, so far in John, Jesus was baptized. He went to the temple and overturned the tables. He, he, he's had three what we call interviews, one with Nicodemus, one with the woman at the well, uh, one with the guy whose son um, was at the point of death. And, uh, and it says, after these things, well, uh, in John chapter 5, verse 1, chapter ago, it says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So Jesus visits Jerusalem four times. Which is the opposite of how I always heard it when I was a kid. I thought he spent all of his time in Jerusalem. Actually, he hated being in Jerusalem because those are the people who were trying to kill him and ended up killing him. So he would go deal with them a little bit. And then he'd go everywhere else where people were actually receptive to the word because that's why he came to seek and save that which was lost. But people who don't think they are lost, it's hard to save them. So, and then he'd come back to Jerusalem and then he'd leave and come back to Jerusalem. And leave. So, in John, in John chapter 5, he's in Jerusalem for a particular feast, which both people believe is the festival of Purim, which happens maybe a month or so before Passover. And uh, it's when Esther saved her people, Queen Esther saved her people when they're in Babylonian in, in captivity and they celebrate that festival. So that's, that's where he had been. Uh, stayed there for Passover and then left and... and uh, after these things, he uh, went to Galilee. So this particular time, he is in Galilee, and the Passover is about to happen. Um, and he, yes. So the Passover that happened after the Feast of Purim. So John only mentions Three Passovers. Jesus needs to have four Passovers for his story to make sense. Um, so his first pa ha Passover happens in year one, and then a year later, it's his second Passover, but only a year has passed. See, two Passovers. It's like having two birthdays, but only a year has passed. Then the third Passover, only two years have passed, but it's his third Passover. Because he showed up, the first thing he did was show up in Jerusalem and for Passover. So that Passover, that first one, doesn't count as a full year. It was anyway and then his fourth passover is three years and that's when they crucified him in passover so uh john doesn't mention his second passover visit he the festival he's talking about is purim but after that luke mentions it in luke chapter 6 verse 1 and 2 it says now it happened on the second sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields and you go the second sabbath after the first what does that mean so, because uh, you have a Sabbath every week. So what could the second Sabbath be after the first? So during Passover, there's always a Sabbath that comes after the other Sabbath. It's like there's two Passovers during Passover week. Let's just say that. And, and so he says on the second Sabbath after the first, and that's the only holiday that is that long, that's going to kind of basically have two Passovers, we'll say. Uh, so he went through the grain fields, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, so he does that, in, and he visits Jerusalem during a time when he was free to walk through the grain fields. After this Passover that's about to come up, Jesus does not any longer like going to Jerusalem at all. He kind of hides from going to Jerusalem because they are seeking to kill him. And it's based on what happens basically in chapter, starting in chapter six, that I call this the tipping point. 
uh, when when they're like, we need Jesus dead. And you think, well, what did he do that was so, well, he didn't do what they wanted him to do. So anyway, after these things, meaning after the festival of Purim and that other Passover that, he, that I did mention, here's what happened. So John chapter six, verse one, the second part, Jesus went over to, over the Sea of Galilee, which is also called the Sea of Tiberias. Um, and, and they call any body of water in Jerusalem a sea. And were they really? No. But they, they called it that. And uh, the Sea of Tiberias, he's kind of telling us where in the Sea of Galilee he was, because it's, it's a long body of water. And Tiberias is a city that Herod built and named after Emperor Tiberius, because I'm going to get in good with Emperor Tiberius. I'm going to name a city after him. And it's in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. So they called that the Sea of... So if you lived in Tiberias, you called that the Sea of Tiberias. Kind of, if you live in Santa Monica, you call that the Santa Monica Freeway. If you live somewhere else, you might call it the San Diego Freeway. It depends on where you live. So um, uh, they called it the Sea of Tiberias because it was up... No, but it's the same sea. So he's crossing over. Why is he crossing over? Because a lot of stuff had happened to Jesus that John just doesn't go through. I'm just reminding us that John, uh, the disciple, the evangelist, the disciple, has already read Matthew, Mark, and Luke and known what they covered. He's like, I'm covering other stuff that you guys don't talk about that you missed. I'm covering all the stuff that Jesus personally made known to me that I'm the only one that got it. You guys didn't get it. And and so that this stuff didn't show up in your gospels. It didn't show up in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. I'm putting it in mine. So I don't need to tell you about what happened at that second Passover because they've already covered it in the other books. Well, here's all the things that happened that he doesn't cover. It's so interesting. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, says, Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. So they've had a little bit of training. It's been a year now. This is Passover number 2. This is in between Passover number 2 and 3 that these things are happening. Uh, and he's saying, Now you, actually, you go out and you go out and start praying to people and cast out demons and heal the sick and... So they go out and do that. So And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So he's dispersed the disciples. And it says in verse uh, 10, And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to a city called Bethsaida. And this is in northern Galilee. This is north of the Sea of Galilee. This is where he's headed. He, once they get off the boat, the John's saying, remember them in the Sea of Galilee, they're going to end up in Bethsaida. And um, he says, and they told him all that they had done. He says, but when the multitudes knew it, because he's trying to get private, like, disciples, tell me, did you have success? Were you able to cast out demons? Give me all the news, everything that happened. He says, when the multitudes knew it, they followed him. And he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. So he's in Galilee, which is the most northern part of, I don't know why I'm doing this out of range, you can't see my hands. The most northern part of Israel is the Galilee. You've got Judea area, Sumeria area, Galilee area. So the most northern part, he's there, and they don't hear the gospel much up there. So he's making a special trip to go up there. He's healing them, praying for their sick. So now he's got a huge crowd following him. Uh, and also in Luke chapter 9, verse 7 through 9, it says, now Herod the Tetrarch, Tetrarch <clears throat> heard of all that was done by him, and he was perplexed. Because he said, oh, he's healing all these sick, and he's, well, he's perplexed because it was says by some that John the Baptist had been from the dead. So during this time period in between the second Passover and the third, John the Baptist has not only gone to prison, but he's been killed. And Herod is hearing all these miracles done, and he's thinking, who's this guy doing these miracles? And somebody, it's John the Baptist coming from the dead to get you. So it says, and by some, that it was John the Baptist. And the other says that it was Elijah had appeared. And by others, that one of the old prophets had risen again. So Herod said, John, I have beheaded. But who is this of whom I have heard so much so many things? So he sought to see him. Like, I, I, don't, think, I don't think it's John because I cut off his head. But who's this guy? So Herod is sending men saying, we want to see Herod come on Jesus. The disciples are telling Jesus all about all the stuff that they went through 
when they went off healing and who got healed and who didn't get healed. And then this third thing happened in Matthew chapter 14, all the same period of time. Matthew chapter 14, verse 12 says, then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it. Oh, this is John the Baptist's body. So John the Baptist's disciples, his disciples, after Herod kills him, because John the Baptist had the nerve to say, you should not take your brother's wife and sleep with her because she's your cousin and also because she's your brother's wife. And John was very upset and how dare you say this and I have to kill you now. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, his, his disciples came and took his body. He says, and when Jesus heard it, oh, and they went and told Jesus, I'm so sorry. So the disciples went, so this is three, this is John's disciples. So this is three sets of people who are wanting Jesus' attention. Herod's men are coming to Jesus saying, Herod, we need you. Jesus' own disciples are coming back trying to tell him all that they are doing and what happened and we tried to cast out the demons and sometimes it worked, it didn't work. John the Baptist, his own disciples have come and said, your cousin has been killed and we want to tell you all about it. He says, so when Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. So there are three reasons he got on this boat to go across the Sea of Galilee. Herod's men were after him, not after him in a bad way, but trying to get him to come see Herod. His own disciples were besieging him with stories about things that, and his cousin had just been killed and he was dealing with that. So he needs to go by himself. He gets in a boat, goes off by himself, needs some time. His disciples show up and no, we've got to still tell you this story. You want to finish telling you the story. <sighs> and then the people follow the disciples. Well, aren't those his disciples? Let's follow them. And Jesus got no time to himself because the crowds are there and he has compassion on them because that's who he is. He didn't say, get out of here. Can't you see that what I've got? God doesn't ever th throw so. Can't you see I'm busy? I'm trying to fix this war in Vietnam and you're trying to ask me to heal your kidney. God doesn't do that. Jesus is thoroughly, uh, his cousin's been killed and all this stuff's going on. And when he sees the multitudes, he starts healing them. He has compassion for them because he's love and that's what compassion does. So after these things, that's what John is saying. After all these things that I didn't bring up, but the other people brought up, he says, verse two, then a great multitude followed him. So now we've got the background for it, okay? A great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. So the sick showed up in Galilee. Uh, Jesus healed them. And now people are coming back and they're all healed. And so... Who, so now the, a crowd, a huge crowd is gathering, right? And Jesus went up on a mountain again to get, well, actually not to get away from them because he knew that he was going to have to teach. And his famous spread abroad and everybody's heard about him. And so he's going to go up on the mountain so that the people can come and he can sit them down and start teaching them. Because if they're only following him before the healing, then when the healing's not there, they won't follow uh, this is why God has a problem with miracles sometimes because we follow if we follow him just because of the miracles, then when there's no miracle, then we don't follow because that's what we were there for. Uh, it's you know, the, there are people who only support their sports teams when they're winning, when they're losing. I know, but they'll jump on the bandwagon. Oh, they're playing for the championship, yay! And they'll buy, buy all the gear because that's just human nature. When something exciting has happened, we're there. But when it gets a little rough and rocky, I don't know if I want to be there. So Jesus, even though all these people are following him because of the healing, he wants to teach them. He wants to give them a really good lesson. So he goes up on a mountain. Uh, it says that Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat with his disciples. So there's two disciples that are pointed out in this story, Philip and Andrew. Uh, Philip is a statistical pessimist. Philip is a statistical pessimist, meaning he, oh man, only eight people showed up. Oh look, there's there's only six cars. He's he's a counter. He's counting, all, and he believes God is able to do whatever God's able to do based on numbers. Uh, that's a statistical. Oh man, where are we gonna? There's like twenty people here. How are we gonna feed all these people? Th those are the. They look at the numbers and then have their whole psyche based on numbers. Andrew is an ingenious 
optimist, creative optimist. Like, hey, there's 20 people here. I think we can make something happen. Phillips, oh God, there's 20 people here. What are we going to do? Right? So there's the half glass half empty people and the glass half full people. So John points out Philip and Andrew, which the other writers didn't do. The one miracle that's in all four gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. They use it um, to impress people. Matthew, Mark, and Luke put that story in to say, look how impressive Jesus is. John is actually putting the story in to say, and this was the beginning of the end. This is when they switched over from the period of consideration to the, to the period of controversy. Now this is the period of where we're going to kill him, you know. Um, so this, this incident is what led to a series of events. And so, because John's trying to explain, uh, and he, who Jesus is and these important moments in his life that he noticed, that he got, that nobody else got. Okay, so it says, now the Passover, Feast of the Jews was near. So this is Jesus' his third Passover. Um, and let's go over these Passover. The, there are four Passovers told in Jesus' life. The first Passover happened in 28 AD. Uh, the theme of the first Passover is for God so loved the world. John records it in John chapter 2, verse 13. He says, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So he'd actually been gathering disciples for about six months. So that's why Jesus, his, his entire, entire preaching career is three and a half years. Um, so the first six months, he was just wandering around gathering disciples and his first real music m musical yeah. miracle well the first music music was Jesus Christ Superstar no his first real miracle was at the wedding of Cana and he was still hesitant to do it then and mom my time is not yet and and he's like whatever you whatever but are you gonna do this miracle so uh he does it but tries to keep it a secret you know he does it and impresses his disciples he doesn't go out and let anybody else at the wedding know what happened but it's he does it okay i'm gonna do this because my, my disciples need to know <laughs> which philip never learned but philip was there because it happened like five miles from his house um that that i'm over nature that nature is, is not over me i created nature so i can make it do whatever i want like uh, jesus is saying i'm over your body uh dona so i'm over your body so I created your body, I, and and I can reverse the blood count, and I, it doesn't matter what the doctors say. I, you know, I made that, so I can do what I want. So he turns the water into wine because, like, I made this water, so I can make it whatever I want. What's wrong with you? And he's hoping that Philip would get the lesson. So uh, he he go, he does the miracle of Cana, and then he goes down because it's Passover. This is Passover number one, but the very first Passover, he kicks everybody out of the temple. He also did it at the very last Passover, the, very, the fourth one. And then right after that, Nicodemus comes to him. And the theme is for God so loved the world. And he's, he, that's what we're supposed to take away. The message from this first Passover is I am sacrificing my life for the world. That's what you need to understand. Um, Passover number two, John doesn't mention. He just says after these things, but it happens in Luke. We talked about Luke chapter six, verse one and two. Let me read that to you. It says, now it happened on the second Sabbath after the first, second Sabbath after the first, which we know is Passover, that he went through the grain fields and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Especially it's Passover. And Jesus has this big discussion with him and says, don't you remember that David, when his men were hungry and tired, that they went into the temple? And and uh, and was hungry, and all the only bread they had was the show bread, which had been reserved for the priests. And only they were after people after it was blessed and all that. Then the priests were supposed to eat the show bread, but the but Abimelech, who which again is a title, not a name, uh, he gave David and his men that bread. He says, so we know that David didn't break the law. So I, I'm not breaking in the law because you don't understand the scripture, which is I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And the theme of Passover number two is mercy and not sacrifice. 
uh, and he's saying, I am, I created the Sabbath. So I, I'm not under its rules. The rules were for you because you don't know how to act. But God is, we're trying to train you, but we actually want mercy in that sacrifice. We, we want you to do the thing naturally without having it being written in the law. You've got to help your brother and you've got to do, we want this coming from your heart. If you're just doing things because the law tells you to do them, then they're, it's not really genuine. And, and so I, we desired mercy and not sacrifice. So Jesus says to them at the second Passover that you don't understand this, what that means. That you, he, he wants things to be genuine. Not, it's like God loves a cheerful giver, not one who gives out of obligation. He, he, he loves it when we give because we want to give. Lord, I want to give to your kingdom. Not, okay, I'm doing this because if I don't, you're going to give me a, a foot disease or something. He, he's not... That's not why we're giving. We're giving because we love him. And he desires mercy, not sacrifice, right? And, and that's another lesson that he's there to teach. Okay, Sabbath number three is the one that's coming up, uh, which is, and I call it the I am the bread of life Passover. Uh, and in John chapter six, verse four, where we were, it says, now the Passover, a feast of the Jews was near. And then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And I'll, I'll get back to that. But, you know, that's we know that Jesus ends up feeding the 5,000. And he's trying to get another principle across to them, uh, which is I am the bread of life. I This bread that I'm passing out, I, I, I want you to understand that I bring life. This is That's why I'm, I'm doing this. I'm trying to give them a visual aid uh, of who I am so that they're seeing this miracle in front of them. So God, Jesus is not just, oh man, I'm stuck. There's 5,000 people here. He's using it as an object lesson, which I'll get to. And the fourth um, Passover, which happened 31 AD. So you got 28 AD, 29 AD, 30 AD. That's what year they're in right now. 31 AD, I'll call, it's called, it's the in remembrance of me Passover. And that's when Jesus breaks the bread. And John chapter 12, verse 1 says, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he'd raised from the dead. We know that he went to their house and that uh, he broke bread with his disciples. And then explaining again, this bread now is broken for your bodies. I was the bread of life passing it out, but I want you to understand further what this bread is about. Um, and again, going back to that second um, uh, Passover, where the disciples were taking the grain and the bread uh, for their physical sustenance. Then G Jesus is making uh, object lesson out of bread at the at the next Passover. Like uh, like I'm passing out this bread is for everyone. Now he's telling this his disciples as often as you break this bread, do this in remembrance of me. This bread is my body. This bread, this wine is my blood. And he's just trying to slowly teach them a lesson at each Passover. Uh, but We'll get to that. So this Passover is Passover number three for Jesus, but his ministry has only been going for two years. Passover number three says, Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, said to Philip, this is John chapter six, verse five, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And then it says, but this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And this is fantastic. So, and I love verses that give away God's personality. Jesus knew what he was going to do, but he still, the test was for Philip to see, had Philip learned anything? The test, like if I've been teaching all week on one plus one is two, and see, I've got this donut and this donut, and I've got two donuts, and see, I've got these two donuts, and I had two more, and that's four. Okay, I'm going to give you a test at the end of the week to see if you've got it, because you've been learning all week long. The test is not to fail you. The devil gives a test so that you will fail. God gives you a test so that you will pass. It's for your good. Oh, good. I'm, I'm, he's putting us in a situation. Now I'm going to use that thing that I've been learning. I've been learning about faith. Now I get to use it. And so Jesus is purposely bringing this test to Philip. What are we going to do, Philip? He says, where will we buy bread that these may eat? Now, Philip was just, he saw, he was at the wedding at Cana. He saw that Jesus can turn water into wine. He could have said, you're going to handle it. I'm not worried about it. Because that's what Jesus wants. That's what God wants 
all to eventually say, you're going to handle it. I'm not going to worry about it. He's like, whoo, yay, you passed. Instead, oh, wait, let me give you another example of God sending a test. Well, okay, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, it says, now all the people witnessed the thunderings and lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. This is, this is uh, Moses on top of the mountain. He's bringing down God's presence, right? He doesn't have the Ten Commandments yet, but God's going to come down in, in all of his glory. And so they see thunders and lightning and sound of a trumpet and all that. But when people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you. This is a test. This is only a test. Should it be an actual emergency? This is just a test. And that his fear may be before you so that you do not sin. So God is doing this being all big with his thunder and lightning so that his fear may be before you, so that you wreck, because you haven't had a personal experience with God for 200 years. You've been in Egypt. <clears throat> so I'm coming all big so that you'll fear and respect and go, wow, this God is awesome. He's incredible. So that you won't sin. Because when I go back up the mountain, you're going to be tempted to sin. And I want you to remember how big and awesome I am. So I'm actually putting you through this test on purpose because I'm trying to, so that when the next temptation comes, when somebody says, we should all go back to Egypt, somebody will stand up and say, I don't think so, because that's a big God up there and he's got, he will notice if we tip off. So I, I'm hoping that you'll apply what you're learning to the next test when it comes. So he's telling Philip, hey, Philip, where are we going to buy bread? that these people may eat. And, and John's saying he's doing, Jesus already knew the answer. That's not, not, God is not lost. When we get in a situation, God's not going, uh-oh. We're thinking that, but he wants us to say, whew, you got it, Lord, you got it. I'm not gonna worry about it. Okay, here's what Philip answered him and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that everyone may have just a little. Now, a denarii or denarii, however it's pronounced, um, is a day's pay. And he's saying if you worked for 200 days, you would not be able to buy enough food one time to feed all these people. There are 5,000 people here. So you're saying, where are we going to buy food that these people can eat? 200 days. If you work for 200 days, two-thirds of a year, th that wouldn't feed all these people, Jesus. So this is Philip not passing the test. Because you're, God is standing next to you. But we do, I'm telling you, we do that to God. God, the doctor said, and it's like, do you know that I'm God and I made that doctor? What's wrong with you? But we, we let what we're seeing, if we're the Philip type of people, we let what we're seeing influence us more than God. Uh, now, here's Philip's personality. Because Philip is a see it, believe it person. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 44, we're introduced to Philip. And John makes sure that you know each disciple and their personality. So in John chapter 1, verse 44, it says, Now Philip was from Bethesda. So, by the way, they're in Philip's hometown. He knows all these people. Uh, that's kind of one reason why God, Jesus is, Hey, Philip, he's not just crazy. I'm just going to pick out Philip. Philip's from this area. So Philip knows these people that are showing up. And uh, anyway, so it says, now Philip was from Bethesda. This is John chapter 1, verse 44. The city of Andrew and Peter also. So all three of them lived there, Andrew, Peter, and Philip. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip should have said, oh, yes, definitely. But he said, well, Come and see, come and see, and then tell me what you think. Because Philip is, I need to see it for, for me to understand it. So Nathaniel, not, so come and see, because that's how you know, as opposed to, no, look, Nathaniel, the word says, and this is, 
well, let's come and look with our eyes because what our eyes tell us is what's most important. That's Philip's philosophy. That's not God's philosophy. God, Jesus is looking at the water and, and, and he's seeing a miracle. Everybody else is seeing water. So uh, remember Peter's crossing the water. He's walking on the water trying to get to Jesus. And he's looking at the water and the water is splashing. And, and the water is, instead of keeping his eyes on Jesus. So we don't have to always go by what our eyes are telling us. Uh, you're going to be, believe me or your own lion eyes. That's what Jesus is saying. Don't keep looking at the circumstances because you. Do, I can change any circumstance. I created everything that you see. So uh, in John chapter 14, verse 7, Jesus says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. You've seen him. And Philip says to him, Lord, show us the father. And then it's sufficient for us. And Jesus went out of his mind. Like, you did not, what? What do you mean show us the father? But that's Philip. Show me. Show me. Hey, Nathaniel, come and see. I need, Jesus asked Philip, what? How are we going to feed these people? And Jesus, he go, okay, I, I'm, I'm counting up all these people, and I figured it out. And if we work for two hundred days, we could not. And that's the person who I'm going by what I see. I'm going by what my eyes are telling me. And Jesus is saying, "Don't worry about what you see. I can change that in a moment. You were there, Philip, when I changed water into wine. So you know I could change stuff. So the test is." God puts us through something, we learn something, and then he's going to put you through something else to see, did you really learn it? Not to hurt you, not to harm, but to give you a chance to exercise what you've learned, giving us a chance to exercise what we've learned. That's why, again, God showed up all big in the mountain, so that when they couldn't see him, remember, it's what I see is what's important. When they couldn't see God, they'd still remember that startling and phenomenal picture of him coming down in lightning and thunder, and they wouldn't just sin immediately. He says he's he's coming so that you'll fear him and that you won't sin. So that because he's trying to give you this image, hoping it will stay in your minds. So one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, and he's just volunteering. So two different things are happening. And again, this is about uh, Philip and Andrew, who are very good friends. You you see them always mentioned together. Philip, he's asking Jesus asks Philip, what do you think is going to be the answer to this? Andrew just volunteers. Jesus doesn't ask him. But one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, says to him, uh, he says, hey, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. Now, no one asked him, but Andrew's like, hey, now what are you going to be able to do with five barley loaves? And again, we're thinking like a loaf of bread. They were flat like pancakes. That's, that's how big they were. And these two fish are the kind of fish that we would consider sardine size. So he's very optimistic when he's mentioning this. But but let's go into Andrew's personality. Uh, in John chapter 1, verse 40, it says, One of the two who heard John speak. Um, so uh, who was there? J James's brother, John. John. Um, I'm sorry, John's bro brother James and Peter's brother Andrew were there when John the Baptist were baptizing. They were originally John the Baptist's disciples. John said, hey, you need to follow that guy. And it says one of the two who heard John speak followed him. It was Andrew. So Andrew was one of the very first disciples who was there with John the Baptist. He was one of the first ones to ever see Jesus. And he's just like, oh, okay, I've been following John the Baptist, but he said, go follow him. All the other of John's disciples stayed with John. They're like, I know you said that, but I'm not leaving you. But Andrew went away uh, and he says, and he first found his own brother, Simon Peter, and says to him, we have found the Messiah. And, and then he brought him to Jesus. So Andrew is like, was the evangelist, like, Peter, you need to come to this guy. We've got him. I, I just have something, I just know. He hasn't said boo to me, <laughs> but I just believe and this is the Messiah, and you got to come see him. So that's Andrew's personality. Uh, in John 1, verse 44, I, already, I had read this before, but this, here's something we're adding to it. Uh, now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And, uh, oh, never mind. I, I, I think I just want to point out that, that Andrew, this was also Andrew's area. That's why I want to point out. This is also Andrew's. Andrew knows these people. 
That's how he's able to talk this little boy out of his lunch. Please go and try to do that. It's difficult. <laughs> so everybody else had food and uh, or no, actually no one else had food. This little kid, he had some little some bread and a couple little fishes. Andrew was able to talk this kid out of his lunch. He was, I don't know how he was able to do that. But hey, I see that people are hungry and that kid has food and I was able to talk him out of it because I know Jesus can do something. I don't know what you can do with it, but I'm just that guy who, who believes. Um, verse, in John chapter 12, verse 20, it says, now there were certain Greeks among those who came to worship at a particular feast. This is the fourth Passover. Uh, there were some Greeks who also came. It says, and they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Well, Philip came and told Andrew, because Andrew had all the personality, and Philip was Igor. Philip was like, oh, Eeyore, I mean. He's a, he, so he went and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew went to Jesus, because Andrew's just, yeah, hey, yeah, sure, Jesus. Philip's like, when they came to Philip and said, you want to see Jesus, he didn't go to Jesus, he went to Andrew. I don't know if he's even bothered Jesus with this. And Andrew's like, hey, come on. Jesus will talk to them. You know how Jesus is. He likes everybody. So Andrew's the more optimistic. Uh, Philip's the more, oh, I don't know how this is going to work. So he says to him, hey, there's a, there's a kid. He's got five little pancakes and two little sardines. But what are they among so many? I don't, I don't know how that's going to help, but I'm offering help. Good for him that that's in his mind, that that's how his mind works. Okay, so this whole idea of you're going to have to feed all these people. And, and God repeats himself. He really likes to, he repeats himself on purpose so that we'll recognize him. He does things. So we'll go, oh, this is just like in the Bible when David versus Goliath. Oh, this is just like in the Bible. So that we'll recognize it. He's not always doing a new thing. He, he, we can look back and go, oh, this situation is just like when Moses, blah, 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 blah. So there was a similar situation in Numbers chapter 11 that the, all the disciples should have recognized because, again, they don't have magazines. They're not watching television. They're not on the, their phones. All they know is the Bible and these stories they've heard since they were little. Numbers chapter 11, verse 18. The people have complained to Jesus. I mean to Jesus, to Moses. Oh, we got nothing to eat. So God comes to them and says, Then you shall say to the people, verse 18, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. And I love that God said, You said that loud enough for me to hear. I can hear you when you're saying and complaining. <laughs> I, Hello, I hear you. Uh, so he says, you said this in the hearing of the Lord. Oh, no, we should have gone back to Egypt. Who's going to feed us? So, so God, so uh, therefore, you shall, the Lord will give you meat and you shall eat. You shall eat not one day, not two days, not five days, not 10 days, not 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you because you have despised the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we ever come up out of Egypt? Which made God crazy. Did you not complain for 200 years? We want to leave Egypt. And then I bring you out of Egypt. Why did you take us out of Egypt? Oh, so who's going to feed us? So I'm going to feed you so much that you'll be sick of food and you will never say, I wish God would feed me. Do you? <laughs> because you, you could be sorry. So Moses said in verse 21, the people who I am among are 600,000 men on foot. Yet you have said, I will give them meat. So this is Philip. Philip saying, there are so many people here. We have to work for 200 days. To just to feed them one time. So Moses, who had no idea how God was going to do this, is telling God, hey, there's 600,000 men on foot here. You're going to feed them? And you said, I will give them meat that they may eat for a whole month? Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to provide enough for them? Is that how we're supposed to do it? 
He says, or, or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to provide enough for them? So he's as confused as Philip is. How are you going to feed all these people? There's 600,000 of them. And the Lord said to Moses, has the Lord's arm been shortened? Now you shall see whether what I say will happen to you or not. So like, has my, did my arm suddenly shrink? Wasn't I the guy who stretched my hand over the Red Sea and you saw Pharaoh's men? Have I forgotten how to do miracles? I'm, and God says that all the time. Didn't I just deliver you just last month? You, and you just two years ago, you were worried about this. Didn't you pray for me? And, and that woman got healed. So you think I've forgotten how to do miracles? You're going to just step back and you'll see what God can do. And God fed 600,000 people. So they already had an experience with somebody asking and questioning God. How are you going to feed all these people? So here's Philip. How are you going to feed all this? I don't understand it. If we work for two months, it's like from your own, I'm still the same God, Philip. But clearly Philip didn't know who he was dealing with. I just think you're a man who has good words. And again, I think at a lot of churches or, the, or spiritual situations, maybe not churches, that's how Jesus is preaching, this good man who has good words. But when we're in trouble, we're panicked because we don't think he's God. Uh, but he is. So we have to quit the panicking. Uh, so Jesus said, make the people sit down. This is John chapter 6, verse 10. And now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. So they're sitting down in all these different groups, uh, which, which in Matthew, they go into more detail about all these different regiments they sit in and stuff. And Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, so first he's giving thanks. Thank you, God. There was one cool um, visual, and I don't know if this is how it was done, but I remember there was one movie where God takes the loaves, they're in one basket, and he lifts it up to God, and when he brings it down, it's just flowing over with bread and fish, and it, all their baskets just start flowing. And I don't know if that's how it did. I don't know. Uh, but, th but it's that idea is give thanks first. Now, he didn't, he didn't have 5,000 fish until after he gave thanks. If we could just learn to thank you, Lord, that you have fixed this situation. Thank you, Lord, that my healing is here. Thank you that the money is here. Thank, let me thank you first, because I believe that you are big enough to handle this, that your arm is not short, <laughs> that it's the same long arm as you've always had. And if you didn't, my Lord, deliver Daniel, my mom used to sing, right? You know, so so why not every man? If you if you, you're the same God. So I'm just, if I believe these stories in the Bible, I know you can take care of my situation. So they gave thanks first, and then he starts distributing the food. It never runs down. So Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down. Like, and the more that they went, the more it, they didn't have 5,000 pounds worth of fish initially. They had more, but the more that they did it, more just showed up. And that's how God is like, just start walking. The more you walk and in faith, then I'll keep giving more as you go. But you, if you want it all now, it's not going to happen. Oh, that's that. Uh, on Sunday, I was teaching about Moses and asking for a sign. Um, how will I, I need a sign before I go to the, to the children of Israel and tell them that. And he says, the sign will be when you get back here, it'll be the same mountain. So the sign is, I'll confirm it once you get back. You got to do it first, and then I'll confirm that you do the right thing. But you want, we want some sort of incredible sign. And okay, now, but that doesn't require faith. God has spoken to your heart. Trust that that's God. He's not going to do some phenomenal thing first, because then it doesn't require faith. He likes it when we just believe him. I'm just trusting that God was God and I'm going to. And then as we act, as we moved, that's when the abundance comes. That's when the, the answers come. So um, he says, so when they were filled. Oh, let me back up. He distributed to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down. And likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were Filled, he said to the disciples, gather up fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. And so they gathered up, well, I'll just read it. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. So God had just, there was abundance, but they had to first trust and start. Okay, I'm going to start passing this out and trust that it's not going to run out. And, and that's 
biblical, right? God, uh, and with Elijah and the, the woman, just start filling up jars, just start filling up jars. And I know you don't have enough oil, but just take out some jars. And as you fill, if you, as you open those jars, I'm going to fill them. And she just kept opening up the jars and coming up with more jars until God filled them all. Uh, the same with the other woman with the cakes. You, you, can you feed me? Well, no, I've got enough. I, I got for two biscuits. I'm going to make one jelly biscuit for me and one for my son. Then we're going to die. Make one for me first. Uh, 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 but she did. But I don't want to. Uh, and then the meal never ran out. And, and that's a, like just get in motion to do that thing God wants you to do. And the rest will come. Get in motion. We want the whole thing solved. And that's just not how it works. Okay. So uh, there were five body loaves left over. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who's coming to the world. And that's from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, where it says, when Moses says, Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, and him you shall hear. And they went, this is that guy. This is that prophet that Moses was talking about because who can feed like this? God, remember he did it in the Old Testament. He's doing it again. Same God. He's doing it today. He will do it. But we've got to get in motion, right, and do what he's asking us to do. Okay, so I will stop there. Uh, thank you again so much for listening in. Uh, on Sundays, we are in Exodus. Like I was just saying, we're, we're, Moses is fighting the call, which is what we do. Fighting, arguing with God. Oh, I can't do that, God. I can't do that. Because he's a human, and that's, that's what humans do. So let's not try to make the people in the Bible out to be superheroes. They weren't. They were just like us. And God used them anyway. Okay, so thank you for listening, and uh, I will, uh, what will I do? Oh, I'll see you next week. Let me, all right, bye-bye.